Hello and welcome to the Cybos Spotlight interview with me, Oshin Lunny. Today, I'm thrilled to be speaking with Diana Paredes about the COVID-19 recovery and having a master data strategy in financial services. Diana is the CEO and co-founder of Suede, a software platform that enables financial institutions to understand and deliver their regulatory requirements. Prior to founding Suede, Diana had a successful career in investment banking, covering all asset classes at Barclays and Merrill Lynch across sales, trading and structuring. While working in the industry, she saw an opportunity to innovate and launched her current fintech regtech startup. She believes that a data driven approach to regulation is the key to preventing the next financial crisis. Diana, welcome to Cybos Spotlight. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Very excited to, to be here. Very excited to have you. Now, you've got a really fascinating career history, and I think your personal experiences have really informed your viewpoint of the world uh, and the financial sector. So let's start, if we may, by going back in time. Can you remember what you were doing when the financial crisis hit the UK? Yes, of course. So the, like you say, it kind of shaped that event actually shaped my, my career. It, it was quite, uh, I think it was quite a surprise for a lot of people that uh, there was a crisis about to hit. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, you know, even when I would check, you know, check with the different peers in different banks, not at Merrill Lynch, um, they were not really understanding the, the, the consequences that were about to happen. But for, for myself being at Merrill, uh, you know, we were seeing very close, uh, you know, quarters where it was going to happen. We were obviously, you know, on the edge of basically being Lehman Brothers ourselves. Um, and uh, if Bank of America hadn't done the, the move of, of basically buying us, we probably would have come bust within that same week. So for me, um, you know, I, I think the because I had just started the year before and uh, I had done, you know, my summer internship in the, the last golden year, basically, of the financial industry, um, I kind of, I think, you know, I got on the last good boat, if you want, to get on in, into banking. Um, but that's also why the, the memory of, uh, you know, really as you know being on the trading floor when the when it became very clear that we were had a crisis in our hands um is very poignant because it was uh, you could see you know your management and your bosses being very surprised by the events uh mm -hmm. people that you were looking up to that were your mentors that you really thought they they had all their their stuff together and that really knew what they were doing uh, actually being really taken by surprise and i think that 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 element i think of surprise of um you know really realizing it's not just like, like another crisis and uh that it was something that was hitting our sector directly and the consequences of the responsibility as well that we had as a sector uh in what we were doing to to the the economy um was very you know like was a big deal for for my career for how i felt about my my you know my progression in the industry and uh, this is also why that's kind of the the motto for our company where it, it's very clear that all the regulation that came afterwards um is actually you know driving us to a much more stable financial system and that it should be embraced and so creating technology that would allow us to to do that um is is part of the reason that we started sweet as well so um yep on the trading floor living it living the dream <laughs> Whoa. That's where I was and uh, dealing with the consequences of uh, what a lot of people had been doing in the industry for the past, you know, 10, 20 years and trying to pick up the pieces as a junior on the trading floor. That's where, where I was when the financial crisis hit. Wow. Wow. So you really had firsthand experience of the crisis <laughs> landing and the consequences. And, you know, like you say, it kind of it, there was a lot of exposure in the industry after that. Things that we thought were certain were suddenly very revealed as being uh, unstable. And, um, you know, of course, after working with Merrill Lynch and Barclays, you co-founded Suede Labs, uh, a reg tech company. Were there any specific experiences in your past that drew you towards this field of reg tech? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, I realized above all since the financial crisis, the regulation that was coming out um, was here to stay, right? So I very much lived this experience of um, the trading for traders, you know, people really thinking that a lot of the restrictions that were coming in from the regulation were just, you know, 
nonsense or were not going to last or that it was just not possible to do business this way. Mm -hmm. And because of my own personal experience and seeing the consequences, you know, in people's lives and my peers and so many people from very close years to, uh, to mine um, were fired. It was like a very intense period right after yeah. 2008. And so from my perspective, I, I kind of felt, well, the solution is not to be fighting against the regulation, right? The solution is to, to really try to create technology that would make this res regulatory absorption less manual, um, maybe even pleasant, you know? <laughs> maybe actually like turn your jobs into something quite interesting as well. And, um, and I could see that there were just so many things that we were doing in banking that were very manual when it came to trying to understand the impact of regulatory change. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why I felt, you know, fundamentally anything that you're pressing F9 in a spreadsheet to refresh could be done by software. And, uh, and that's what basically got us to, to set up Suede and to, to start our adventures in, in RecTech and, and be, I guess, you know, one of the, the first new companies really in the, in the sector when we started in 2014. Fascinating, fascinating. And it's, it's really, um, I have this image of you, like the, the light bulb going on and people were refreshing <laughs> the spreadsheet and you were like, why are we doing this this way? We, you know, it was like a clear opportunity to make people's lives better and careers easier and companies more efficient. And, you know, many years later now in 2021, reg tech is an incredibly hot topic. Why do you think that's happening now? I think that the like anything, right? So a crisis and the impact of legislation and regulation takes time to sink in. Sure. Um, and and I think that the you know I mean a lot of different uh, people in the sector, um, you know obviously all our clients are people who have seen that coming um, before 2021. But I think that you look at what's happened last year with COVID as well. It's kind of accelerated that you know absorption and that kind of anticipation as to what RegTech could really be doing for the sector. Um, and so I think that the, the reality is that people want less manual intervention because the consequences of fines and of not doing the correct thing, basically from a regulatory piece, uh, are quite are becoming very clear in terms of how the regulators are coming at it. Um, and I think that COVID has, has only exacerbated the, the reality that the way that regulators are interrogating the financial services um, is actually more and more ad hoc, right? So one thing is COVID, but then we need to be preparing to a world where there could be any other kind of crisis and the regulators will come to the bank or to the financial institution and basically say, well, can you give me an idea of stressing your whole balance sheet and understanding what that has as an impact for you? And if you're not able as a financial institution to respond with agility and with speed, you could be hit by a fine or you could basically lose a lot of credibility to your regulators, which nobody wants to be in that position um, as, a, as a financial institution. So I think that 2021 with the kind of interrogation that came to trying to understand what the impact of COVID was on the financial industry um, from the regulators directly very much, you know, lit up a lot of alarm bells that maybe in some places, if you've been doing the same thing for, you know, the last 10, 20 years manually, and if now there's better technology to do it, that will make you a better, uh, I guess, respondent to what the regulators are asking you. And, and that's the place you want to be, right? So I think it's, uh, it's uh, I think it's always been a hot topic. <laughs> I mean, the, I remember in uh, uh, I presented actually for for Cybos the topic of RecTech uh, in Toronto a few years ago, and that was you know something that a lot of people had not heard of, and I think that now um, all of this is just getting accelerated, and if not amplified by the the experience of COVID and, and what that means for our industry. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And that was a great side bus. I really loved side bus in Toronto. I was I was there, and um, you know you're speaking about this. A revolutionary new, new idea that reg tech and um, you know the user experience of folks working there should actually be pleasurable and you're improving that experience and that's super important in 2021 COVID's put it under the spotlight now in a kind of related field another important topic in 2021 is ESG so how do you think reg tech overlaps with this ESG agenda so again I think that the the reality with ESG is that regulators, some of them more vocally than others in the UK, definitely the regulator is quite vocal about ESG, um, are really looking around the world at a way to measure if you're doing the right thing in terms of you know, your ESG agenda. 
and uh, the moment regulators are involved or the government is involved, which is what should be happening for these things to, to really change in the world, yes, um, yes. The, the, you know, you really have to start presenting and, and representing fundamentally KPIs, right? And so how you're actually moving towards that target as a, as a company. And so um, when it comes to things like ESG reporting, so currently there is still a lot of questions around that. And, and we've actually been part through the work that, that we've been doing with different institutions and, and the regulators and um, you know, thought leaders in the space over the past few months um, to really understand like what kind of reporting you could be doing around the ESG agenda and what kind of metrics can the financial industry present back to the publics and to the regulators and to government to make sure that they're doing the right thing when it comes to the ESG piece. And so uh, RecTech is again, you know, a, an opportunity for automation around that topic. Um, and so if you think about a lot of the, the metrics that people are considering when it comes to, to ESG, uh, the data for it is actually already being captured by a lot of what you need to be sending to the regulators anyways. And so if you have um, basically a very ad hoc, you know, completely tailored made solution for your institution rather than something that really automates uh, and is basically not driven by professional services, but much more uh, about taking data and putting them into a normalized, you know, submission format, um, you're going to be in trouble because it's, it is very much the same data. You could just look at a world where you're adding those, those KPIs to what already you have to be submitting and automating that whole process. Uh, so I think that, you know, there is a huge overlap in terms of the data, of course, which we, you know, we're, we're big fans of the data topic and data standards and, and all of that what that can achieve for our industry. Um, but then, you know, also you are talking about, about the reality that you need um, for the new world, right, to be able to add this kind of um, requirements in terms of KPIs of what you're demonstrating back to government and to the regulators in a much faster and, and agile manner. And RecTech is really the only way to, to make that happen rather than having a huge new project with hundreds of people manually doing something in your office, which obviously is a thing of the past that we've all given COVID does not allow us to be hanging out in offices <laughs> in yes. the same way as before. So so yeah, that's why it's uh, there's a huge overlap and also a huge opportunity as ESG progresses in, in its own understanding as to what KPIs we should be asking for. Fantastic. So RegTech can really supercharge the whole ESG agenda at the moment in history where it really needs to be accelerated above everything yeah. else. That's such good news. Thank you. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and you, met, you mentioned there that, uh, you know, obviously folks can't go into offices at the moment. You mentioned the financial crisis earlier. We are obviously in the midst of another global crisis at the moment with the COVID-19 pandemic. So from your viewpoint, how can RegTech actually support and drive the recovery from COVID-19? So I think that the, the reality with RegTech, um, if it's the right kind of technology, is again around data and the power of unlocking that data. And so there's a lot of data that any financial institution is already responsible to really submit in, in the right way, but currently is doing it with very ad hoc band-aid kind of approaches rather than a very much holistic and harmonized process from data to, to submission. Um, and so the, the point is that, you know, in the same way that it is for ESG, so being able to simulate scenarios, being able to, to really pretty much that, at your mercy, uh, be able to look at the data and the impact on your balance sheet, the impact of different things um, at a much faster, and you know, instead of having to, to do a whole new project to just figure out a scenario is actually critical. Um, I think that, you know, during the financial crisis, the regulators, like I was saying, you know, they took a step back in terms of, you know, deadlines for submissions, uh, but they they didn't in the point of view that they were asking for a lot of information to make sure that the financial industry was not about to collapse on top of COVID as well. And so that meant that they interrogated, uh, you know, our clients and financial institutions around the world um, very precisely around how their balance sheet was being stressed around their liquidity uh, in a much more ad hoc way than just the standard submission process. And, um, and so if you think about, you know, entering back, you know, into as in restarting the economy, uh, we need our financial industry to be solid and to be stable and to be able to to stress its scenarios, um, you know, pretty much immediately to make decisions. And and why is that important? Is because the financial industry is going to have on its shoulders loans, 
restarting the economy in terms of financing SMEs, uh, you know, citizens, people that are going to be in a lot of trouble when it comes to, to looking at, at uh, availability for cash. Um, and so I think that the, the reality, again, of RecTech automating things, having a good handle of your data so that you can stress your, your scenarios and understand them a bit better to make decisions faster uh, is going to be really essential to, for the financial industry to, to really help restart the economy. Uh, we have in front of us, you know, a year, two years that are going to be very difficult. Uh, we're lucky that this is not a financial crisis. <laughs> it hasn't been caused by the bankers this time. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, that does not mean that uh, we don't have a responsibility to, to do something correct as a financial industry for citizens this time around. And so the best way to, to play that role is going to be by understanding very well the positioning of your balance sheet and of you know different requirements from the regulation and your ability to lend and to help the economy to to restart so that's why RecTech is going to play a huge role i think when it comes to to covid 19 um the recovery on the back of it basically absolutely yes and of course cybos is where the world's financial services ecosystem fintech regtech etc gathers so i'm just wondering if there are any folks out there who are watching and they haven't really begun to work with it already. Uh, Diana, could you explain some of the benefits of RegTech specifically within the financial services ecosystem for our Cybos community? Of course. I mean, RegTech, you know, I always like to take the definition from, from the FCA, which is very specific around it being leveraging new technologies. So you don't want, I'm not talking about RegTech that is old school software repackaged with marketing around it, but I'm talking very much about leveraging of, of the best in class of what is already available and being used in other sectors and bringing it to the financial industry. Uh, RegTech, uh, you know, a bit beyond the definition of new technologies is really one-on-one -on -one innovation in enterprise software for a whole industry. And, and so what that means, so one element that we're, we're you know, we really think is very important is really trying to remove as much as possible the element of very manual configuration because that's actually very risky in terms of errors and mistakes because we are human and humans are, are you know we're not perfect um, and where you almost want to leverage of automation uh, of you know natural language processing machine learning um, as far as you can before putting a human in the loop. Uh, when it comes to, to reg tech, obviously, you know, it's the, the domain is very specialized when it comes to accounting, when it comes to finance, when it comes to compliance, when it comes to law, and the individuals in those spaces uh, cannot be replaced because there's a lot of subtlety around that. But what you can do is give them, like I was saying, making their job more fun, uh, where they don't have to be the ones doing the whole, you know, like thousands and thousands and millions and millions of records, eyeball kind of analysis, yes. but where you actually give them tools to be able to, instead of, you know, always try, you know, reacting to the regulation to actually be able to be a bit more ahead and to be able to do better insights for the organizations as well. Uh, and that's what I mean by, you know, in, in, in machine learning and NLP, you always talk about the human in the loop, you know, being very much like, you know, the individuals that can, that can basically, you know, be empowered by rec tech, uh, by leveraging of the best that technology has to offer nowadays. And, and that includes as well, of course, things like cloud computing, uh, that includes, uh, you know, the observation piece, which I think is also, of course, very important. Um, and, and I think, you know, importantly, it will also mean, um, an upskilling of the industry, a change in, in legacy thinking and, uh, you know, in, in, in legacy systems is one thing, but it, there is a reality that you also have to change the way that the industry thinks of the way they work. So um, that's what, you know, RecTech is, is about, right? So leveraging of the best of modern technology, um, leveraging and, and really thinking about data standards, open standards, uh, open API architecture, interoperable systems. Uh, those are very good principles that if you're a buyer of enterprise software for the financial industry, you should make sure that uh, whoever is selling you software is really ticking the box on, on those bits of the, the architectural stack because that's what's going, that's coming our way. It might even be regulatorily imposed in the next few years. Um, and so you're better off making sure that you're absorbing software and buying software that is abiding to this kind of, you know, open, modern, new technology approaches so that you can be bulletproof for the future as well. Absolutely. And coming back to the G of ESG, we were talking about ESG earlier. What would you say is the importance of 
agile governance within financial services and indeed how can reg tech improve agility so i think that the you know agile governance as a concept is something that applies to organizations as well to governments and um you know one thing that we've realized in, in our work you know interactions with regulators and, and with large organizations as well as smaller ones is that the way of making decisions or changing certain things, the, the cost of change effectively, um, is just not really automatic and it's not automated. Um, and unfortunately it means that it just, because it ends up being something that is so subjective rather than really based on facts and on data, uh, it really prevents an agility of decision, which is quite important in, in periods of stress and of challenges like what we've just gone through in, in COVID. Uh, the governments that have been the most efficient in their response have been the ones that have been able to be the most agile and to get feedback from what they were imposing as rules uh, and then making quick and ch changes and adjustments um, very much, you know, to a concept of, you know, like an MVP, uh, you know, in a young company and being able to respond quickly to feedback and, and iterate and, and learn from that. So the concept of agile governance, I, I think, is 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 becoming primordial um, in our in our modern societies and, and in general uh, to try to really understand how we have to cope with change, right, and how to cope with change in a way that's efficient and where you really can take feedback, learn fast, fail fast, and then go back to markets. And in the case of a government, it goes back to its citizens. In the case of, of a financial institution or any kind of corporation is, is go back to, to your customers. Um, and so I think that, again, you know, anything that helps automation is the key to, to be agile because you cannot take like the feedback loop, the cycle, of uh, getting information in from the market or from you know your citizens um, to then respond to it. If you look at, at governments, it can take five years, right? If that's and that's fast for regulation, um, and and you're looking at a world where people are very getting very used to getting almost instantaneous responses uh, in the context of uh, what the World Economic Forum calls the fourth industrial revolution. Um, you know, you're looking at technology that's moving a lot faster than what governments are, are able to, to keep up with or that what regulators are able to keep up with. So there is a reality where if you don't almost adopt internalized technology yourself as an organization or as a government, uh, it becomes very hard to do the right thing towards your citizens um, in terms of regulating that, legislating the right things to make sure that technology doesn't get off hand and, and, and doesn't start doing uh, things that, that really are not in the right direction when it comes to ethics and, and other things. So if you really want to talk about agile governance, um, there is, you know, like it gets amplified with the context of the technology piece and being able to really understand that. And then you need to be agile and you need to be able to accelerate the feedback loop because actually the consequences um, you know, are becoming faster and faster and more accelerated. And you can't have a feedback loop of five years because before then the technology has completely moved on and it's already done the damage that you wouldn't want uh, to have on your citizens or even your customers. So I think that the, the rec tech conversation, I mean, there's also been, you know, like a, a topic around what they call soup tech, which is supervisory technology. I'm not a fan of the term myself, but, you know, it's what people have been using. Uh, the, it's very much that if you want agile governance, uh, you need to really internalize better technology because we're talking about agile governance in the context of uh, accelerated scenarios because of technology, because of the stresses we're under, because of the environmental stress uh, that we're seeing in our planet, because of, you know, things like COVID. And it's just this agility of response that is becoming uh, just very key to anyone that wants to survive what's coming our way post-COVID uh, or the environment or, you know, like a modern fourth industrial revolution world uh, where things will be moving and continue to move at an accelerated pace that you can't really capture properly uh, just in a, in a human uh, alone approach basically for sure L life moves fast these days and it's, it's just moving faster and faster and we really need this uh, as you described it this augmented intelligence and the data helping the professionals to do the best possible job for all of humanity for all of these ecosystems now yeah. you mentioned consequences there that's a, a very interesting word a data sorry regulatory compliance is you know, a, a very important topic, particularly when you think about some of the potential penalties and consequences for company directors and for companies uh, around non-compliance. Um, how would you say that data standards can help companies with regulatory compliance? 
So we've been working ourselves as a company at Strait on you know data standards for the since the beginning of our company, and and the reason that it's a topic that we're we're very passionate about is because we believe that our industry needs data standards that are one open source that are actually free uh, for people to use and available. Uh, there's a lot of like data dictionaries uh, and you know languages out there um, that actually require a lot of fees to get access to or to understand and where it becomes a bit of a perpetration of uh auto you know of like manual uh, intervention of professional services rather than automation and so data standards in many ways is a way to unlock uh, the potential of our industry we have so much data and we have very little access to it and we have to go through all of these hoops to get it back uh, and so i think that the you know more and more, you know, we've been very vocal about this since inception of our company, and, and that's why I guess we've been pioneers in, in the topic, but more and more you find that regulators are bringing that back to the table, uh, understanding the importance of, you know, having data standards. Um, and that's definitely great. I mean, one thing that we, that you know, I think the whole industry is a bit wary about as this conversation of data standards is progressing, is that, you know, if you are a city bank or if you are, you know, a large financial institution, uh, data standards in, in your in one country is one thing but what you really are talking about is that you like a harmonized approach to you know global data standards uh, so we have been working you know on that front quite a lot but what you really would want is the regulators to to almost get together and agree uh, on data standards that work for for you know across all the countries because then you're really talking about uh, data that can be unlocked cross borders which is obviously quite interesting and exciting uh, even for topics like kyc and and, and other things um, so i think that the you know data standards is critical um, the best way obviously as a financial institution to lobby governments and regulators towards really coming to the table to create data standards is by having you know a data standard approach yourself within your organization uh, to have a very clear um, I guess, mandate in terms of harmonizing data, data sources, uh, and not having a situation where, you know, a data definition in one place, in one staging database is a very different thing in, in another staging database. Loads of enrichments, loads of flags across your data, all of those things are not good home economics, I would say, when it comes to having a data strategy. So, um, you know, we're entering a world where when we started, there were very few CDOs, so chief data officers, um, in the industry, and they were actually more at the larger financial institutions than, than anywhere else. And now what has happened is that over, you know, as, as our own journey has grown and that we've been saying that data was basically the, the, the important thing when it came to regulation, but when it came to the industry in general, mm -hmm. uh, you will find that CDOs in large financial institutions now manage thousands of people from the few hundreds that they used to when we first started. And then now even the smallest, uh, you know, tier two, tier three type financial institutions also have a full-time CDO. So this, uh, you know, chief data officer, this kind of architectural mandate, harmonization across your different systems um, has become also a regulatory requirement that's very clear. And uh, it, it's gonna have to be industry led. I think it's gonna be very important for the industry to almost be able to lobby back to the regulators to do the right thing when it comes to that, because it's, it's something that sometimes the industry does better. Uh, so working on open standards, open dictionaries, sharing your data dictionaries, having a much more like open approach when it comes to data and how you define your data within your databases is going to be key for, for the future as well. Fantastic. It sounds like a very uh, suitable and timely uh, manifesto there for open data and data harmonization. Um, and as you've been talking about, uh, you know, over our discussion, you know, RegTech is about a lot more than just avoiding fines. It's a powerful tool for governance. It can add genuine value to businesses. It can streamline processes. It can improve productivity. And it could, in theory, even introduce completely valuable, completely new ways of working. So. From your perspective, how far do you think we are from the future of digital supervision, where standards and cutting edge technology are applied across the industry? So the technology is there already. I mean, we do that, right? So we have technology that would allow our regulators to, to have pretty much instantaneous access to, to information if that's what they wanted, obviously with the financial industry being on board around that conversation, which is a bit of a different story. But I think the adoption of RegTech is a lot more up to individuals 
right now than 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 anything else because that's the reality with innovation that's the reality with change so i always like to say that you know implementation of rec tech it's not difficult. I think when we started, a lot of people would speak about, oh, you know, the legacy systems, the spaghetti code, the data is all over the place. It doesn't make sense. How are you guys going to do this? And what we realized is that it has nothing to do with the with the systems. The technology is available. I mean, we have the most performance system in the market. We've created that technology that made that future possible. Mm -hmm. So, and there are other companies in the space, whether it's KYC and you know different reg techs that are also doing you know amazing work when it comes to to modernizing uh, the infrastructure of the financial industry. But the thing that really has to change, and that you know we are seeing the change happening already, is more this legacy mentality. So different ways of working. Um, regulatory conversations have been driven by, you know, specialized fields, right? So whether it was law or accounting, um, you know, they are very used to working in a certain way. It's a, a lot more manual. This is like the way that legislation takes five years to change is because that's basically how it's done. It goes through a lot of committees and conversations, not necessarily always based on, on the right data or facts. And sometimes it's the loudest voice in the room rather than really the, the, best, the best approach. And so that's this legacy mentality that we've been talking about, which we've seen management very much embrace for the change. Um, because you want to reduce the risk of fines, you want to reduce the, the manual intervention, you want to reduce the cost, which is basically what Rectech can, can present. Um, but that's the hardest friction in implementation, I would say. It's more, you know, if you've done your career for 20, 30 years in a very conservative space, which is risk, finance, law, compliance, it's difficult, right, to think, well, now I'm going to get this immediately in front of me and I'm going to have to make decisions. And so some people are more prone than others to, to embrace that. Um, but that's the biggest shift, right, that, that we find. And, and I think that overall, you know, our users love it. And I think it really hits them how much more they can do with their work. But it's a bit, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And so it changes the way they work. It changes their also their own power internally in the organization. They can become uh, the people that have access to the best data of the bank. They could, you know, they can have that kind of responsibility back to the board now because they can actually demonstrate sorts of things that they couldn't before thanks to to our technology. So I think it's um, it's um, like you know the friction on the the mentality shift around working differently with technology enabling you, removing the things that maybe you don't like to do so manually in your job and embracing, you know, more analysis, more responsibility, uh, you know, more understanding as to how you can respond to the regulation rather than always be, you know, trying to turn off fires, which is a different way of working for sure. 100%. I mean, it, it sounds like such a, a hugely valuable, compelling opportunity. Um, but, you know, not every company is on board. Uh, you know, what do you think some of the challenges are? D you know, do financial institutions face challenges, specific challenges when it comes to actually implementing reg tech? You know, is it people? Is it education? What's the kind of the blocker here? I think it's definitely, you know, coming back to what I was mentioning before, it's definitely going to be more on the on the people side, unfortunately, than, than yeah. anything else. So that's why I was saying that, implementation actually if people are you know have the right mandate and and they're they're happy to change technology basically is actually quite straightforward uh because you you have a much more performance system you can actually remove a lot of the terrible things you're doing to your data uh, you can go back to stores you can go back to first principles with the you know the right kind of rec tech solution um anything that's kind of staging more manual interventions things like that they they fundamentally, you know, reduce the the purity in the analysis that you can make, and that's where there's been this kind of black hole of resources, of money, of professional services, of implementation costs that always keeps happening in our industry, and, and that's the stuff that RegTech is really trying to to do a step shift away from, um, and so I think it's. Uh, 
it's there, right? It's a bit like, you know, if the iPhone is there and it exists, it's just people trying to get used to using the iPhone. Like, you know, when uh, people suddenly started to kind of move away from Blackberries or from the kind of dialing phone to being able to touch a screen, it, some people will adopt it and understand it faster than others. And, and for some people, it would be a bit of a shift. And, and for some people, they want to continue using the really old school phone, uh, you know, but, I, but yeah, but, you know, more, more often than not, then, you know, a few years later, Apple is one of the <laughs> the fastest growing companies, makes a lot of very new time companies because there is a shift in the way that we use technology. And, and that's what RegTech is in many ways. Absolutely. Uh, th th that you've just brought back a, a memory. I was working in Canary Wharf at the time. I remember getting my very first iPhone. And just unlike all the other handsets I owned that had manuals that were bigger than the phones, the iPhone had like this little piece of paper. You didn't need it anyway. It was, it was just magic. Yes, absolutely. And um, so I'd like to just digress uh, just for a, a, a tiny bit to talk about some of your other work. I mean, it's very related. It's very complementary. Um, but talk to us a bit about the kind of work you're doing with the World Economic Forum, because I think that is fascinating, very informative. So with the WEF, um, we've had the privilege actually of, of becoming technology pioneers and, and we've been that uh, for the past few years and now we're global innovators, so we're, we're very connected to, to their wonderful community. I think that the, I mean, obviously the, the work that the World Economic Forum does is very focused on this commitment to better the world. Um, and when you think about the innovation that we've been proposing in the industry, our motto of preventing the next financial crisis, the work that, that we do thinking of regulators, supervisions, financial stability uh, is very much driven to, to that, right, in the sense that you are trying to make sure that at least as a sector, financial services, which is such a pillar of, of how, you know, consumers and citizens are, are protected, um, does the right thing. And that's what regulation is there to, to do. So the work we do with the, with the WEF um, every stream of the, the work we do with them is connected to this, whether it's data standards, uh, whether it's, you know, rec tech, financial services. Um, and, and more importantly for us, we've been quite involved in the piece around agile governance uh, for the fourth industrial revolution that I was mentioning before. Um, and there's been some work that we've done with the OECD around that as well. Uh, because there, what you're saying is, you know, obviously as technologists and innovators, there's so much we can do. Like I was saying, the technology is there for a lot of things, but you need for things to really be embraced, you know, from different sectors for, for this technology to do this kind of step shift. And so we can do it in financial services. I mean, financial services have the resources and, and you know, it's been very fast from like an adoption perspective relative to what a government can do. But we know from our own experience with regulators that there is a lot of goodwill um, to do the right thing when it comes to adoption of better technologies or understanding of better technologies, but the resources are not there and they're not really being given at the, at the right speed. So agile governance in many ways is around that context of um, being able to represent our fintech community and our rectech community and our innovators community uh, in, the, in the conversations uh, that are happening around government so that they understand that they need to get up to speed as well if they want to regulate things better, if they want to make the right decisions around whether you know AI is moving in a certain direction that's not protecting citizens and, and all of that. So it's a bit like putting the, the responsibility back in their court as well. And thankfully, a lot of governments are up for the, for the challenge. Um, and it's just that we need a lot more of that, right? We just need to change the way that um, governments regulate themselves as well, where they have their own responsibilities. And I like to think um, at governments as a, as a company, right? So a company, a startup has KPIs, you know, or if you have investors, if you have customers, you have responsibilities towards them. Uh, you know, citizens, we are the customers of the government and governments have to become efficient. And uh, there's a lot of people that want that change to happen, but they don't necessarily have the right resources to make that uh, technology shift that governments themselves have to start embracing to get that feedback loop, to get that response from their citizens, to be able to make better decisions for the citizens. So I think we, as, as their customers, uh, we need to start demanding for that agility to become the way that governance happens uh, at every level of uh, governments, of regulators, and also large corporations, as well as smaller ones. It, it should just be a different way of governing fundamentally and of making decisions when it comes to, to um, adoption of technology. So I mean, we're very excited, obviously, with the work that we do with the, with the WEF and that, because it's very much, um, you know, like helping to understand 
how NLP, how machine learning, how artificial intelligence, how modern technologies uh, can have a very positive impact. And we use it in our own world, you know, for, for the work we do. But, you know, it also needs to be looked at very carefully to make sure it creates a world that's safe and that you know enables citizens um doesn't just cut jobs for the sake of it mm. and uh where you're actually making sure that it does not create more bias um and you know technology is a force for good if not before we know it if you don't regulate it the right way or understand it the right way you're going to have a revolution of citizens on your hands being very against it, which is also dangerous. And so that's what we're trying to, to work towards when it comes to the work we do as a, as a broader company piece. Excellent. I love the work of WEF. I think it's just fantastic. And an interesting point you made there that, you know, governments are like companies. Uh, I wonder how many governments, governments would get good net promoter scores if they were asked. Um, right now, I'm very not, few. <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, no shade. I'm not going to suggest anything. Anyway, um, just I've got one more question for you, just because we do get folks, you know, coming in from more the tech side of things, fintech, reg tech, etc. Talk to us a bit about how reg tech is engaging with new technologies. So I think that the the piece around automation is very strong when it comes to reg tech. It's uh, probably essential in terms of very much being able to go from data to an output uh, without, you know, in between staging, I guess, of, of, uh, of your data. Um, I think that the analytics, you know, being able to get this kind of like instantaneous um, output in terms of understanding what you're actually doing in the food chain of your data to, to output is, is quite important as well. So almost having like the right kind of explainability um, when it comes to RecTech is, is very important. So very strong analytics piece um, in terms of the, the technology ad adapted, but also um, it's not just about data science, it's, it's in the financial industry, it's also about people who understand the topic very well, which is actually practitioners. So it's almost mixing these data scientists with the practitioners and giving you the best kind of analytics uh, for you know, explainability and decision-making. And uh, then obviously things like you know, natural language processing, machine learning, um, you know, which we worked with quite a lot is, is quite important when it comes to rec tech. It's, it, it becomes possible, um, for a company like ours, if you're doing the right thing with data to actually train models, to train algorithms, uh, if you don't have that data, which goes back to the data standards conversation, it's very difficult to really do that work well because you need a lot of data to train uh, any kind of algorithm. So it's uh, RecTech makes a lot of those things possible, the data concepts, the data standards, the the right kind of principles around data discipline make all of these things possible. Um, obviously, you know, big data architecture, open architecture, interoperable systems. Uh, it's, it basically means technology that has very clear ways and points about how to connect with APIs. And, um, and that's very clear when you see, for example, integrations that we have to do with more modern companies versus old school ones. Um, they have a lot of API points and ways for things to connect very, in a very straightforward manner. Whereas old school type, you know, databases and, and systems, there is no way to connect to their systems directly and you have to do a lot of staging for, for that interoperability to become a reality. And so those kind of things are actually quite important when it comes to, to the technologies that you're, you're adopting. Cloud computing, um, difficult to you know, accelerate the, the absorption of that because there is a lot of very real issues around data privacy and responsibility and liability of data loss. Um, but the industry is progressing through that. So the technology again is there. We're trying to just make sure that as an industry, we're doing the right thing to protect our, our you know, consumers and citizens and, and all of that. Um, but yeah, that is the, the, the way that RecTech is engaging with new technologies. It's basically possible to do these things rather than impossible, which is the case for legacy systems. Uh, and you're almost moving at the same time with regulators, with the industry, with legislators to make sure you're doing the right thing as you're embracing those new technologies. It's quite important to, to make sure you're in line with where legislation is going, basically. Fabulous. Well, that sounds like a win to me. Uh, thank you so much, Diana Paredes, CEO and co-founder of Suede, for joining us today for this special Cybos Spotlight session. Thank you so much for having me and thank you. Thank you very much for the questions. Wonderful. To everyone watching, thank you so much for joining us today and for being part of the global Cybos community. And I wish you every success with your master data strategy in financial services. My name's Oshin Lunny. See you next time.